Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful we get to come into the house of God tonight. Lift our hands and our hearts before you, Lord, and experience your presence, God. What a joy it is to be in your house, to be in your presence, God. Lord, as we approach your word tonight, God, we pray that you open it up to us, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, the instruction, even the correction that we need for our everyday lives, Lord. And we give you the praise and the glory as you come and you speak to your church, God. Have your way in this place, Holy Spirit. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves also. We'd ask it for all the churches that are both preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else. But we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building one kingdom. That's yours, Lord. So, God, we ask that you bless all of our brothers and sisters. Bless the Baptists, the Lutherans, the Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel, Harvest, and Oak Valley, uh, for the well and the way, for Ecclesia, for Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist. God, for the assemblies and the four square denominations, our Catholic and Adventist brothers and sisters. Lord, all the wonderful churches that are naming Jesus as Lord, preaching your gospel this night, God. We pray that you bless them as you would bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, Amen. Amen. Tonight, grab your Bibles, go with me to the book of Exodus. We're going to be in Exodus, the 15th chapter, towards the end of the 15th chapter. So if you find Exodus 16 and back up a couple verses, you'll be where we're at. Now tonight, before I give you the title, I got to tell you something, is that, uh, like I mentioned before we prayed, I have been living this this message. In fact, I've been living it for some time now, a couple of weeks, uh, you know, and, and, and even today, I totally failed. Can I, can I just be honest with you? Can, I, can, can we talk for a moment? Because if there's any sort of hypocrisy in the pulpit, there's no grace. Okay, so I need the grace of God as do you, so let's just be real for a second. This morning, I failed at what we're about ready to talk about because, you know, I was getting ready and, and you know, it's my, I'm getting my, my game face on, getting ready for work, that sort of a thing. And, and uh, it, you know, from the moment I woke up this morning, it seemed like something was, you know, just bugging me. My wife starts telling me about her plan for the day. And, you know, I, to be honest with you, I'm still waking up. So I'm like, honey, I, I don't want to hear your plan for the day. You know, I want, I want to just like wake up. And so it was kind of like, Rawr, you know, we started the day out with that. And so then, you know, um, I'm getting ready and she had already left. She took the kids to school and that sort of thing. So she calls me up and starts talking to me about something. And I'm going, honey, wait a second. You're telling me about that. What about this and this and this and this and this? And so, you know, it was like, bam, you know, I'm into it. And so I'm just totally failing at what we're about to talk about tonight. Just, just so condemned, so just uh, convicted, if you will, about what has been going on in my life. Now, I've repented, but you guys want to know what it is? All right. The title of tonight's message is Stop Complaining. Some of you guys just got blessed by the title right now. said, I could pack it up and go home, Pastor. Thank you, Jesus. Exodus, the 15th chapter. Let's take a look at it together. Exodus, the 15th chapter. Now, I've got to set the stage. Exodus 15 is a great chapter. Uh, the children of Israel have just gone through the waters of the Red Sea. God has delivered them with uh, miracle signs and wonders. He has wiped out the greatest army at, at that time on the planet. And so here they are. They've come out with this great deliverance. And all of a sudden, it's almost like the end of a Bollywood movie. You know what I'm talking about when I say that? Anybody remember Slumdog, right? And what happened at the end of Slumdog? Or what was that Snow White movie or whatever it was that they just had at the end of the Bollywood movies, there's always like this big dance number, okay? I, I know I'm kind of geeking out on you guys right now, but I mean, they have like these big songs and big dance and, you know, they're just kind of doing the, the whatever dances, you know, and, and everybody's into it and they're all, you know, kind of doing the same twirl. Anybody know what I'm talking about or is that just me? Okay, good, good. I'm glad I'm not the only crazy person in this, in this place tonight. And so here they are. It's like the end of the movie. Moses starts breaking out in song, right? Here's the big Bollywood dance number. And just when you think that it's over, Miriam comes out with all the ladies with the, t you know, the, 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 the timbrels and the, and, the, and, the, and the stuff, right? So they're singing their songs, they're dancing, they're praising, they're, they're just going nuts, right? It's, it's this wonderful time. They're singing about the deliverance of the Lord, what God did, and then God starts to lead them. They start walking. A day goes by. Two days go by. Three days go by. Now, that wouldn't be so bad, 
walking through the wilderness except that there was no water. Uh Uh-oh. Exodus, the 15th chapter, starting in verse number 22. Let's take a look at it. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now, three days in the wilderness is bad enough. You know, I start driving my wife down to Joshua Tree, and all of a sudden I got to hear about how terrible the desert looks, okay? So the wilderness is bad enough. It's a joke, by the way. But yet, the wilderness with no water, how many of you know that's just miserable? I mean, you can survive about a week. I, I, I read somewhere uh, today about 100 hours with no water. So, you know, a day is okay. Second day, now you're starting to get the headaches, right? That sort of a thing. Third day, I mean, things are happening. Dehydration is setting in, and it's not good. So you're physically not going to feel very good. Verse 23, now when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara, meaning literally Mar, meaning bitter. This was a bitter place, bitter waters. How many of you know that oftentimes in life, after a great victory, like we shouted about tonight, talked about he has overcome, and we've overcome by the blood of the Lamb, right? And and we we said, uh, you know, who's gotten healed, who's gotten delivered, who's gotten some sort of provision, that sort of a thing. And we all love to shout about that. But life, oftentimes after a great victory, you will notice that there are bitter moments that come. A lot of times you're going to experience these great, wonderful victories, and then depression will come and try and come in. Why? Because it's not like it was just a couple weeks ago when we were, you know, fighting the fight and the battle. We overcame, and, 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 and now what? See, bitterness can come in many ways. Sometimes bitterness could come in the form of a death of a loved one. Sometimes people stop at that place like Abraham's father did, right? There he stopped at the place that bore the name of his son. Sometimes people just can't get over that. Why would God do that? We were going so good. Something was so great, and yet this happened. Why did that have to happen? Sometimes people can get into bitterness of life because, you know, so there was a disappointment. They were believing God for something, and it didn't come through. It didn't work out the way that they thought it was supposed to work out. Bitterness can come in our lives. And, and when we stop at those wells of bitterness, you, you can't drink. You, you can't just sit there. You can't take it in. It's not going to be good for you. It, it, it's actually poisonous to your soul if you allow it in. But look at verse number 24. The people, having seen God do miracles, signs, and wonders, having seen what God did to the Egyptians, having seen God turn water into blood, having seen God part water, now comes to bitter water, and and rather than say, Lord, what do we do? Look at what they decide to do. Verse 24, they do what Pastor Dan did this morning. The people complained. Now, I know it's really quiet in here right now because nobody wants to move because if you move, someone's going to know that you complain too, all right? Let me just take the pressure off. All of us, I think, at one point or another could say, I have complained about something. I know the words of my mouth have not always been godly or holy or everything that they've wanted to be, so shake it off. We're all human. You can stop polishing your halo and put that away now, okay? Because no one is so holy that you're perfect. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. So let's just shake that off for a second. It's okay to say amen, all right? You know, because, you know, you say amen too loud, someone's going to think they're judging me. You know, they know what I did. No, you can say amen, and, and, and you can say on me, too. That's all right, too. Perfectly acceptable. People complained against Moses. Now, what did Moses do? Moses delivered them from slavery. Moses stood up for them. Moses prayed for them. Moses was the one listening to God. He was the, the leader, and they complained against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Now, what shall we drink is not a bad question. But if you're complaining against someone questioning like that, then then it's bad, right? See, there's a difference between, hey, Moses, what are we going to drink? The water's bitter. Can can you tell us what to do? And, Moses, what are we going to (laughs) drink? You see the difference. He said, my teenage son talks to me like that. Hallelujah. Verse 25. Look at what Moses does. So he beat the people over the head, right? He just let them have it. No. Moses is a godly man. So he cried out to the Lord. Look what the Lord does. The Lord does something unusual. So the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Everybody say sweet. Sweet. See, your bitterness in life doesn't have to stay bitter. God has a solution. God has an answer. God can turn your bitterness into sweetness. 
See, sorrow may endure for a night, the Bible says, but joy comes in the morning, and those who reap with tears, shall, so I'm sorry, those that sow with tears shall reap with joy. See, God is, God is a God of blessing. God is a God of healing. God is a God of restoration. God is a God of increase. Now, listen, yeah, there's problems along the way. Yeah, there's bitterness of life, but you don't have to stop there. You don't have to drink that. God can take that bitter drink, and God can change it. God can turn any situation around. The Bible says God works all things together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. That means all things. If, in case you're wondering, well, what does all things mean? All things means all things. Even God can take bitterness in life. God can take death. God can take uh, a need and lack and want. God can take hunger and thirst and pain. God can take the trial and he can turn it around and turn it into a testimony. God can take any hopeless situation and can bring hope. God can take any dead situation and bring it to life. That's the God we serve. When he cast it in the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them. There he tested them. See, it's in the bitterness of life that proves what's on the inside of us. It's in the bitter times of life that God comes and shows us what we are made of. The missionary Amy Carmichael wrote that no matter how hard you jostle a cup filled with sweet water, it can only spill out what's on the inside of it. Not even one bitter drop can come out. And so in our life, we need to take a look at what's coming out of us. Why? Because if complaining and groaning and mumbling is coming out of us, we've got to do a heart check. It's time to adjust some things. It's time to correct some things in life because the wrong thing is coming out. When I woke up this morning, the wrong thing came out. When I talked to my wife on the phone today, the wrong thing came out. So what did I do? I called her back. As soon as I hung up the phone, I stopped and I said, no, that ain't right. So I called her back. I pulled her out of the meeting that she was in and, and I said, honey, this is important. She said, I'm in a meeting. I said, is the meeting more important than this? And I made her get out of that meeting. Why? So that I could repent. I could apologize and I could tell her, listen, we need to get in unity. We need to get in love. And I'm not letting you have no meeting until we get back on the right track. No matter how annoying that is. I'm, I apologize, honey. Sorry to the guys in the meeting too, if you're in here. He tested them, verse 26, and said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. See, God was proving to the Israelites what was on the inside of their heart. Now, the Bible does not record that they had any symptoms of dehydration. The Bible does not record that they had headaches. The Bible does not record that they even sweated, okay? But we can think and we can say, well, they were in the wilderness walking through, uh, you know, dry desert places. Potentially, they could have had some physical things going on. Maybe they were wondering, you know, if we get out of line with God, is God going to do to us what he did to the Egyptians? We don't know what was going on because the Bible doesn't record that. And yet, in our life, we know what's going on when we go through wilderness places, Right? We know what's going on in our lives when we're walking through places. We don't understand what, God, what are you doing? Why are we going this way? God, the, you know, there's a faster route over there. You know, God, we, we really could go over by the ocean. It's a lot prettier. It's a lot greener that way. But God, okay, well, I guess we're going this way, right? And pain starts to come in and bitterness and different things happen. And, and, and we understand what goes on in our lives. And God is saying, listen, if you just listen to my voice, if you just follow my ways, what I tell you to do, if you just walk in the way that I've commanded to you, then guess what? I won't do anything that I did to the nation of Egypt. You don't have to worry. I, listen, God is not waiting to hit you over the head with a two by four. God is not waiting to punish you. God is not storing up all of this stuff so that he can vomit it all over you. No, God is not that type of a God. In fact, God took all of his wrath for sin out on Jesus on the cross. And therefore, if you are in Christ Jesus, you are no longer a child of wrath. Now you are a son or daughter of the Most High God. You're a king's kid and he deals with you as such. And therefore, look at what he says. For I am the Lord who gives you sickness. I'm the Lord who beats you up. 
I'm the Lord who takes pleasure when you have pain? No, I'm the Lord who does what? Who heals you. See, God is telling them, look at even if you have dehydration, even if you have headaches, even if you have physical ailments, even if you do get sick, I'm not the one who's going to put that on you. I'm the one who's going to heal you. Just follow me. Just follow me. God is the healer. Now look at verse 27. I love this. Verse 27. Then they came to Elam where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. So they camped there by the water. You say, what does that mean? Well, look it. They just had a victory. They had a triumph. They had a bitter trial that took place. That trial was turned into sweetness. They were given the instruction of the Lord. They heard the voice of the Lord through that process. They learned something from God. They learned something about God. In fact, God revealed a new level of his nature to them. I am Jehovah Rapha. I'm the Lord that heals you. And now all of a sudden, they go to a place of provision where God just opens up, abundantly supplies, pours out a blessing on them. I mean, it's 12 wells of water. That was one well for each of the tribes. And 70 palm trees. I mean, if they were looking for shade, you just found it right there, right? See, now they've come to a place of comfort and a place of blessing, and God is telling them, look it, just follow me. I'll lead you in the right way. You don't have to sit and drink the bitter water. Right around the corner is where I want to get you to. Right around the corner is a place. Don't give up when you hit bitterness. Pray, ask God what his solution is, and don't... Don't complain. Tonight, how to stop complaining. Anybody want to know how? Okay, I'm preaching to the choir and myself and everybody else. Okay, so anybody want to hear that? Yeah. All right, praise the Lord. How to stop complaining. Number one thing, number one thing, repent and pray. Now, repentance has become a dirty word. I don't know why. It's a great word. Repentance is a wonderful word. In fact, as soon as I realize I need to repent, I do it. Why? Because God gives me permission to in his word. God says it's good for me. Why? Because, listen, as, as people living in these flesh bodies, there is a war that's going on between the flesh and the spirit. And sometimes, you know, as Christians, we have these victorious and we're just walking, we're holy, we're all that, and the bag of potato chips, and we got it going on. And then right when we realize it, we get lifted up in pride, right? And we have to do what? Repent. Or we're doing the right thing, we're going the right way, and all of a sudden life jostles you and the wrong thing comes out. Maybe you hit your thumb with the hammer while doing that home project and a high school word just flew up out of nowhere, right? And you look around and you say, I don't see the devil. The devil didn't make me do it. That must have came from the wrong spot, right? So you have to do what? Repent. See, there's nothing shameful about that. Nothing shameful about repentance. Why? Because God gives us permission. God says to do it. And he says, if you confess your sins, I'm faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And repentance is so easy. I was going this direction. That's the wrong direction. I realized it. So what do I do? I change my mind, change my course, and I go back God's direction. Right? That's, that's as simple as repentance is. God I'm messing up. God, I'm wrong. I'm going this direction. God, I am wrong. I'm, I'm changing God. I'm going to go this direction. You know what God says? The moment that you confess it, his word goes into play because God, God cannot deny his word. Therefore, the moment you confess it and, and you, you, you ask the Lord for forgiveness, God says, forgiven, freed, cleansed. That's it. So if you find yourself, like Pastor Dan this morning, complaining, repent. Stop it. You're going the wrong way. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, very interesting if you want a, a, a good read. 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, it says that all of these stories in the Old Testament were kept as examples for us. That God wanted us to learn the lessons. And he says, and don't do this because some people fell by that. Don't do that because some people got messed up with that. Don't do this. And then he says, and don't complain. Because there were a lot of people that got destroyed when they complained. So repent, turn. See, the first thing Moses did once he realized what was going on for the people was pray. He didn't go to the people, he went to the Lord. And he cried out to God and he said, Lord, what do we do? Now, later on, you can read in the account in the book of Numbers, there was a rebellion that took place against Moses and his brother Aaron, who was the high priest at that time. Okay? 
And, and at this rebellion, these men and women, their families, everybody, an un, unusual thing happens. The earth opens up and swallows them all up, <laughs> closes up behind them. They are all wiped out from the face of the earth. And so the people, after they see this, start to murmur. They start to grumble. They start to complain. And they say, well, who's this Moses? Who's Aaron? You know, and what's going on with the Lord's people over here? And, and has God really commanded them to lead, right? Now the Lord says, hey, Moses, Aaron, get away from them because I'm about ready to consume them. Moses and Aaron, you know what the first thing they do is? They fall on their face before the Lord. And then Moses says, Aaron, I want you to go. I want you to take a censer, fill it with fire from the altar, and go and put incense on it and stand and make intercession for the people. And so he goes and he stands between the living and the dead. See, that censer, that, that, that incense there was like the prayers of the saints going up before God. See, when something's going on in your life and you're starting to feel the effects of a complaint and complaint and complaint and complaint and gossip and malice and slander and anger and hate, when all that stuff starts spewing out of you and you realize, repent and then pray, God, I need some help. God, I, I, I need your wisdom. God, I need a guard on my tongue, Lord. I, I, God, I, I need to put the right thing in. God, help me. Go and pray. Before the Lord. In fact, it's so interesting that when you take a look in the Word of God, that, that fire is associated with our tongues oftentimes. All throughout the Bible. I'll just put this one up on the overhead for you, but in James chapter 3, verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. See, the unregenerate tongue when used improperly, is set on fire by hell. And therefore, if you got hellfire coming out of your mouth, it's time to repent. It's time to go to God and say, God, I need some, I need some help. In fact, if you read James, the third chapter, you go on, it says, who can tame the tongue? It's, it's an unruly evil. It, it steers the course of our life, and you start feeling kind of hopeless until you realize no man can tame the tongue, but the Holy Spirit can. And the Bible tells us that our God is a consuming fire. That God can come and he can burn out the fires of hell. See, God's fire is greater than hell fire. God, God is an all-consuming fire, and he can take us like silver put in the crucible, and he can burn away the dross, those inconsistencies, those things that we thought we were over that, that trying to churn back up and come back up, the things that taint us throughout life. See, if you allow the fire of God to hit it, God will purify you of that thing. You get into that presence of God in prayer. You're there in... Exodus, turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 here, Isaiah has a vision of the Lord. He sees the Lord, sees the train of his robe filling the temple. The angels are crying out in front of him, holy, holy, holy. Isaiah chapter 6, take a look at what happens. As soon as Isaiah gets a vision of the Lord, he gets a vision of himself and realizes how sinful he is. Isaiah the 6th chapter, I'm just going to read three verses. Verse number 5 through verse number 7, look at what it says. Isaiah, the sixth chapter, verse number five starts out. So I said, this is after he sees the Lord. He says, so I said, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. Remember, this is the Lord's anointed prophet. There, there are five chapters before this where he's prophesying. And yet, when he sees the Lord high and lifted up, what does he say? I, I'm, I'm undone. I am a wreck right now. Why? Because I realize what's going on in my life. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I think we could say that for our society today. You know, mockery and, and cynicism has become funny. It, it's kind of cool to, you know, make fun of other people. Bullying is a big topic in our nation today in schools and things like that. And people with the words of their mouth are tearing down others to the point where kids are committing suicide because of what's being said online. My goodness, we dwell in a people of unclean lips. There are things taking place uh, all over, and people are starting to spew things out online that they would never say in person. Don't realize they're a bunch of cowards. But this is the, the land that we dwell in. We've got to realize and recognize that, hey, this starts with us. We've got to correct the way that we talk. We've got to make sure that the wrong thing is not coming out of our mouths. Look at what he says. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. There's that fire of God. And look at what he says. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. See, when you bring your life before the Lord and you allow God to get in to your life, God will come and he will 
make the changes. God will deal with the heart. God will deal with the lips. God will deal with the tongue. God will deal with the hands. God will deal with the feet. Whatever it is going on in your life, if you allow God in, God will come and he will change you. He will rearrange you. He, Jesus said, behold, I make all things new. So you don't have to act like the old man any longer. That old man has been crucified with Christ. But if that old man is starting to try and come up and resurrect, you need to Go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm dealing with this. God, the flesh is rising up. God, there's a war going on. Give me the strength. Give me the victory by the blood of Jesus. So tonight, how do we stop complaining? Number one, repent and pray. Second thing, how do we stop complaining? How to stop complaining? How do we do this? How to stop complaining? Number two is follow Christ's example. You all missed a very good opportunity for an amen right there. I'll just let you know that right now, okay? Let's try that again. How do we stop complaining? Number two is follow Christ's example. Okay, now Jesus lived a perfect life, right? Yes, yes, he did. Okay, let's try it. See, you guys have got to play with me. It's Wednesday night. Come on now. All right, Jesus lived a perfect life, right? Yes, yes, he did. Therefore, when you look at the life of Jesus, do you ever find Jesus belly aching? Do you ever find Jesus complaining? Do you ever hear Jesus just wailing, crying out, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know what to do. Uh, no, you see Jesus on the mountain all night praying, right? You see Jesus knowing what he's going to say. You see Jesus saying, I hear from my Father, and that which I hear, I, I speak. Jesus was our perfect example. You're there in Isaiah 6, turn me to Isaiah 57. Oftentimes we, we go to these verses when we're talking about healing. Oftentimes, sorry, Isaiah 53, verse 7. Isaiah 53. Oftentimes we go to these verses during Easter. But in Isaiah 53, take a look at Jesus. Jesus is our example. He's the captain of our salvation. That means he's the one that went out in front of us and now he says, follow in my footsteps. The book of Hebrews tells us to look unto Jesus, run our way, race with endurance, that we're to focus on him as we're running this race of life. Because he's the author and the finisher. He wrote the story, and you know how he wrote it? He wrote it in himself. He showed us how to live the life. Showed us how to be in life. And now as we follow his example, we see how we can stop complaining. Isaiah 53, verse number 7, take a look at it. It says, he was oppressed... And he was afflicted. That sounds like bitter waters, doesn't it? He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Can I say this to you in the old King James version of what this text is really saying? Okay, let's go San Bernardino KJV. Is that all right? Shutteth thou uppest. That's what it just said in the old King James Version. Is that okay? See, when you're going through bitter times, it's not time to grumble against the leadership. It's not time to talk about your neighbor. It's not time to even do the self-effacement thing that many people are doing. Well, I'm just an idiot. I'm just a, I'm just a downcast. I'm just an outcast. No, let's get off of all that. Let's shut our mouths and let's look for what God's going to do. Let's follow Jesus' example. Notice something, notice something. Okay, Moses cries out to God. God shows him a tree. Now, I was reading some commentaries today, and I was kind of amused because they were saying, you know, if it was the eucalyptus tree found in this part of the world and they threw that in there, then it would have taken all of the bitterness to the bottom of the pool and therefore the top could have been. Now, by... Many scholars' calculations, there was hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that were out there in this wilderness. So how big of a tree did it have to be to go into this pool of water in order to suck all of the bitterness down to the bottom so that they could drink the water from the top and have it be sweet? See, can I use a, a play on words here? I don't want to water down what God did. Because for God to turn bitter waters into sweet waters after a tree is thrown into them is nothing short of miraculous. 
okay? I, I don't care how great of filtration systems we have here. How long were they sitting there before that tree would have sucked all of the bitterness down to the bottom? See, I don't know how that works unless it's just a flat-out miracle. And my Bible didn't say God sucked all the bitterness down to the bottom. My Bible says God turned it into sweet waters for them. So what was it about this tree? What was it? Why did God show Moses a tree? Remember, all of this stuff was examples for us. I believe this is the reason why, because when you look at the Bible, when you see examples of things throughout the Bible, trees symbolize something in the Bible. Trees usually symbolize people, right? The blind man, his eyes are open. He says, I see people walking around like trees. Talk about the cedars of Lebanon. Talk about the different trees, right? The, the, the different kings that were there. And there were trees that represented the different nations and all that kind of stuff, okay? You see that all throughout the Bible. But it doesn't say the trees. He didn't show them the trees. He didn't show them the people. He showed them a tree, right? Showed Moses a tree. Now, when you read about cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree, and then you find that in the New Testament, the book of Galatians, that is speaking of the cross of Jesus Christ. Is that right? Can everybody follow that logic? So therefore, I believe that what God was doing was he was showing Moses a shadow, a type, an image in the Old Testament of something that was going to take place in the New Testament, that when bitterness comes to your life, you are to take a look at the cross of Jesus Christ. You are to consider him who endured. You are to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher. You are to look upon his suffering. You say, why is that, Pastor? See, that's great. Clap, that's a great shout. But why is that? Why does God want us to look at the cross? Here's why. Because nothing that you're going through, nothing that you're suffering, Nothing you have need of can ever compare to the anguish of Jesus Christ on the cross. Not one of us, not one man, woman, child who has ever lived or ever will live, except for Jesus, have ever experienced a break in the Father. In other words, God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, right? Nothing can separate us from his love. God is ever present throughout our lifetime. Jesus is the only one on the cross who experienced the Father's turning away, and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, right? So the anguish of knowing the separation from the Father was only experienced by Jesus on the cross. Now, whether or not when people are sent away from the presence of God when they go before him at the final judgment? I don't know. But what I do know is that anything I'm suffering here on the earth, even if it's a physical suffering that could be compared to a crucifixion, which when you take a look at the accounts of the crucifixion, no, all right? There's, there's just nothing that compares to that. It was the cruelest torment. It was the worst capital punishment ever inflicted by the Romans. It was systematic, it was painful, and it was meant to be dragged out as long as humanly possible. It included physical pain, it included mental anguish, it included fear as asphyxiation set in on the lungs. The I mean, there was just all sorts of stuff that was associated with it. Not to mention the mocking and the scourging and the, and, and the beard being torn out, being spit upon and rejected by people who he loved. None of us has experienced that. What am I saying? If you want to complain about life, just take a look at what Jesus went through on the cross. And you will realize, my life ain't that bad. You know what I'm saying? You know, there, there's moments that I go back to in my life. I, I remember there was a time where I was in Mexico. And there in Mexico, we were on a mission trip. We were uh, doing kids' programs and, and building a church. We were painting a church. And there came a time in that trip that they drove us out, and they said, we want to show you guys something. We want you guys to go and meet some people. We said, okay, cool. So we, we drove out, and we went out, and, and we went. And as we were driving, the smell just kept getting worse and worse and worse in the, in the vehicle we were driving in. Finally, we pulled up to a dump. There in the dump, there were kids rummaging through all the items on the ground. It was so bad that out of the side of one of the hills where they were dumping all the stuff down this, this, this big ditch, out of the side was coming smoke. It was just literally burning up out of the ground. And yet these kids were just sitting there looking for something that they could use, something that they could sell, something of value, something of worth. Maybe some food had been thrown out, something like that. And I remember that time. I remember thinking to myself, my God, I don't, I don't live like this. I've got a bed I sleep in every night. I, I've got food on the table. I, I don't have to live in the middle of a trash heap. I don't have to live in a dump. See, when you consider the trial of someone else 
and you look at your own life, you say, man, God, I don't, I don't have it that bad. No, I'm really grateful for what I do have. Thank you. I'll just shut. I'll just zip the lip. I'll just, I'll just be over here, right? <laughs> Consider Jesus. Follow Christ's example. See, crying out to people is not going to get the job done. Crying out to God, that'll get things done. Jesus cast himself upon the Father, cried out to the Father, went to the Father, prayed to the Father. Let's follow Christ's example. How to stop complaining. Number one, repent and pray. Number two, follow Christ's example. Last one for tonight. Last one for tonight. And I like this one. This one's kind of fun. Edit your script. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, edit your script. Look at your other neighbor and say, edit your script. See, what do I mean by that? Anybody heard of life hacks? You guys heard of this stuff that they're doing now called life hacks? They've got all sorts of stuff. It's kind of like life tips, you know? And, and, and they put it on the internet, and it's kind of this new thing that they're doing called life hacks. A uh, couple of life hacks for you. Like, here's one. Um, when you finish a jar of Nutella, you know what Nutella is? Kind of like peanut butter, only the chocolate stuff. Anybody like that stuff? Okay, so you guys do know what it is. When you finish a jar of Nutella, you're all done with it. Here's, here's one of their life hack tips, right? Is, is put some hot milk in it, shake it up, and you've got instant hot cocoa, right? Hot chocolate there. All right, that's, that's like a life hack, so you, you can use it, right? Here's another one. Uh, if people keep stealing your pens off your desk at work, put a red cap on your blue pen or your black pen because people are less likely to steal a red pen than they are a blue or black pen. That's a, that's a good one, huh? Life hacked. Here, here's a tip. We need to edit our script. What does that mean? That means that when you're going through what you're going to say or do. And life is giving you bitterness. And you start to look at that, and the script starts getting written in your head. I can't stand this. I, I just don't believe that this is even happening to me. Why? Woe is me. What is going on? This just, we, we just dealt with this. Didn't we, didn't we just deal with this? Anybody feel that way other than Pastor Dan at times? You know, okay, it's okay to be honest. Remember, we're, we're all safe in here tonight. You know, so, so, so as you're looking at, at, at life, and the script is starting to be written in your head, as you realize what's going on up in there, it's time to start doing editing. We can do this without the complaining. Anybody know what I'm saying? We can edit that part out. That is a life tip for all of us, including myself, is edit the script. Before you speak, think. Thank you. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. New Testament. Philippians chapter 2. Great couple of verses. Philippians chapter number 2, verse number 14, verse number 15. If you have a problem with complaining, memorize these verses. Because as you get the word in you, then when life comes at you with bitterness, trials, problems, pressures, when that cup is jostled, what's going to come out of you? The word. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 and verse 15. Take a look at it with us. Philippians 2, 14. Do all things. Everybody say all things. All things. How many things does that include? All. all. Thank you very much. You guys are good. See, I knew you guys had it in you. Do all things without. Edit. Right there. There's the life hack, okay? Edit that part out. Do all things. Go ahead and do all things, but do all things without. Edit the script. Get it out of your life. Stop it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do all things without complaining and disputing. What's that? Arguing. Verse 15. Here's the outcome. That you may become blameless and harmless. You know, complainers have a reputation. I remember I was talking to one guy, and he was working in, in construction field and, uh, and, and switched jobs. And when he switched jobs, he went over with somebody who he, he knew from church. And there on the job, he was learning and training and all that kind of stuff. And so he started learning the trade that he was going into. And as he was learning, he started to, you know, he, he really had a lot of respect for this guy that he went to church with. And that's one of the reasons why he, he, you know, accepted the job offer and went over there and started learning this new trade. But he realized after a little while that his friend had a reputation. And that every time something would come up, he would start complaining. 
And at one point, a guy actually was sitting in the break room with all of them there, and they started talking about something, and all of a sudden, complaints started rising up out of them. And this guy who wasn't even godly looked at him and said, man, you're the most complainingest Christian I've ever met in my life. See, but if you don't complain, now no one can blame you, right? You will become blameless and, if you don't argue, harmless. The Bible says, be wise as serpents, yet harmless as doves. Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. We know the world is messed up. They're worldly. We know the world is full of sin. Why? Because people are sinful. Okay? But that doesn't mean complain about how sinful they are or argue with them thinking that that's going to get them into heaven. They're just going to blame you and they're just going to uh, find fault with you. They're going to say you're a harmful Christian, you're hurtful, you beat me over the head with your Bible. It doesn't work. It's time to start editing the script and take, do all things, but do it without complaining. Go to work, but go to work without complaining. Go home and be with your family, but be with your family without complaining. Go hang out with your friends, but hang out with your friends without complaining. Can anybody say amen in this place? Look at the rest of verse 15. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights. In the world, some translations say you'll shine like stars. Yeah, there's blackness all around. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's bad. We know that. But even in the darkest of night, there are stars shining through, shining and singing the praises of God, showing us the way, giving us direction, giving us hope for a future. What did we learn tonight? Tonight we learned how to stop complaining. Number one, repent. When you know what's happening, just stop Turn back God's direction. Go back his way and pray. Ask God, God, what can I do? God, come and consume this. God, come and burn this out of me, Lord. Come and let the fire of God hit this. God, I just put myself as an offering on your altar. What else do you do? Well, number two, follow Christ's example. Consider the tree. Look at the tree. Let God show you the tree. God, give me a vision of the cross. God, show me the anguish of Jesus Christ. God, show me, uh, just let me, let me hold my life up to the light of Jesus Christ. And as I do, God, I'll realize how good it really is, God and I won't have to complain. Number three, edit your script. Anybody learn anything tonight from the word of the Lord? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, before you guys leave, I want to want to talk to you for a couple minutes, and, and then uh, at the end, I want to pray for the sick. I believe that God would have us to, because he's the Lord that heals us. And so before we get to that, I want to make sure before you leave this place that your heart's right with God. Be a tragedy. We had such a good time in the house of God. Talked about the things that we talked about. You know, we had some laughs, had some fun. Uh, you know, all of us together could relate to something like that. And yet, it'd be a tragedy if we had such a good time in the Word, such a good time praising the Lord and worshiping Him, feeling His presence, shouting His name and having that victory. It'd be a tragedy if we did that. You walked out of this place. Your heart wasn't right with God. You died and... You didn't go to heaven, but you ended up going to hell. Now, sometimes people think, well, pastor, I don't believe in hell. Well, the Bible talks about hell, Old and New Testament. Jesus himself spoke of it. So it's a very real place. And just by burying your head in the sand and denying hell's existence doesn't mean you're going to avoid it. You're going to have to deal with the reality of it. Now, sometimes people say, well, pastor, I, I, I don't have to deal with that because, you know, all roads lead to heaven. Just do whatever you want to do. I'll do whatever I want to do. That church group can do their thing. This group can do their thing. And as long as we all stay true to ourselves, we'll all make it there somehow, some way. But again, the problem with that thinking is nowhere in the Bible does it say all roads lead to heaven. That's like saying all roads lead to the moon. We know that you can drive around the earth as long as you want, and you will never make it to your destination. In the same way, do you think that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried it out in his son Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross? We talked about it tonight. Do you think after going through all of that sorrow, all of that pain, all of that anguish, that he would just say, yeah, whatever you want to do or however you want to live or whatever this church group says or this committee says, yeah, they, they just do your own thing and I'll see you there. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That means it's God's heaven. We're going to have to get there God's way. Can't get there your way, my way, some well-meaning church committee's way. Got to get there God's way. 
Now, many people think at that point, well, cool, pastor, because I know God's ways by being good. I've been really good. I've been a good person, been nice to my neighbors, given money to charities. You know, I was raised in church by good parents, and they hung a cross for St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? Born in America, America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven. And you know, not only when I was a child did I go to church. Here I am sitting in church in front of you right now. I consider myself to be a Christian. My last church, in fact, I got involved. I helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church, and people thought of me as a leader. Been a really good person. Done a lot of good. Raised in church. Got involved in church as an adult. And now here I am, considering myself to be a Christian. Do you know the problem with that? Is that nowhere, check it out, nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can be good enough to get to heaven. Check it out. It's not there. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not going to make it there on our own merit. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And the standard for heaven is perfection. So if that's so, then, then how do we get into heaven? You say, well, wait a second, Pastor. I know God. I can quote scriptures to you. I, I celebrate Easter and Christmas every year of my life. That's great. I'm glad you can do those things. But have you read your Bible? Do you know that the Bible records that the demons know who Jesus is? They're not Christians. Bible records the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth. And yet, he's not a Christian. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about having mental assent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. Rather, what is this about? It's about your heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Not going to get there any other way but by being born again. Now, I know our society has made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals, made it out to be some weirdo, fanatical stuff. But listen, this is not about what the world says. Rather, this is about what God says. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart. Remember, we're talking about your heart. And that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. He says, when I come, I want to find you hot, or I want to find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are pretty gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what does he say? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out. A little up, a little down, a little token for every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, look out. Why do I say that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, if you know you need to give God all your heart and you know you need to give God all of your life, I'm going to do this. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. Bang! Pop my hands together. Just like that. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that. Bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Dan, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand... I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. Let's push past that tonight. Let's get over that embarrassment. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than to just end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Moment of possible embarrassment? Come on, no one's that dumb. And yet the devil thinks that you are. That's why he's trying to push you out of this. And that's why I'm getting in your face tonight, pushing you towards the things of God, saying, come on, will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. I've done my job. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job sending Jesus, beaten, bloody mess, hung on a cross for you and me. Now, your turn. Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? If you're not sure about your salvation, come on tonight. Tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand? If you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, giving them all of your heart and your life, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place and you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it, you're ready to make a right relationship with God, acknowledging your need for Jesus by simply raising your hand. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe, hey, come on, get ready to get your hand up right where you're at. Online, across the nation and around the world, wherever you're at, get ready to get your hand up. God's watching where you're at too. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, 
three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. Thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you. Who else tonight? Two wise people already. Two wise people already. Come on. Where are you at tonight saying, I need to give God all my heart, need to give God all my life? Who else tonight? You're saying, yeah, that's me. That's me. Anybody else? Don't tell me they all ran away when we finished the message. Anybody else? Come on, let's go for God tonight. Thank you. Three, God bless you. Who else? I'm just going to give you a moment. Thank you for, God bless you. Who else tonight? Say, I need to give God all my heart, need to give God all of my life. Spirit of the Lord just spoke to me, there's five more of you. And you need to give God all of your heart, you need to give God all of your life. Where are you at? Where are you at? You're saying, I know God's tugging at my heartstrings right now. Who else? Now you're saying, yeah, I know that's me. We join these four other wise people tonight. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Who else tonight? Say, I need to give God all my heart, I need to give God all my life. Anybody else real quick? Come on. Where are you at? Where are you at number five? Just pop it up when I'm looking your direction. Who else tonight? Anybody else? Come on. Let's go for God. Let's go for God tonight. Thank you, number five. Okay, number six, come on. You know that's you? Just pop it up. Anybody else? Come on, number six, where you at? Let's go for God tonight. That's you. Let's do this. Let's do this. I'm going to ask everyone to stand. Don't clap during this time, okay? I'm going to have Elijah just minister on the piano. Those five of you that raised your hand and the others that need to come, just get your stuff, whatever you need, whatever you brought with you tonight. If you need to get a friend, just grab that friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front right now, okay? Just come. you that did raise your hand and say, yeah, I need, need to give God all my heart, need to give God all my life. Come on down, come on down. They're still coming. Anybody else? Come on. everybody up front. Look up here. You can put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, all right? I want to encourage you guys. Right over here to my right, your left. This is my friend, Pastor Joel. He's a really good guy. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, okay? Then he's going to give you some free information, some free literature to find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then he'll introduce you to a friend we have here in the church called the Spiritual Personal Trainer, okay? He'll tell you how that works, and then he'll let you come right back out in church service. Your friends and family, they'll wait for you, okay? Now listen, listen. Let me give you guys a, a promise, okay? If you give us one year of your life sitting under the teaching here at the Rock Church or Lottery Center, one year consistently coming as often as you can, getting into the Word of God, okay? After that year and for the rest of your life, you will just be so blessed that you will say to yourself these words, I never knew it could be this good. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right. Okay?
Perez will make a left turn, follow past you all right this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise tonight. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.